This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 43rd edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Today is my special guest. I have a famous Olympic skier and 1984 Olympic gold medalist, Deb Armstrong. Deborah, I'm going to give you a, more of an introduction in a moment. Let me just go through a few housekeeping things here. Today is my engineer. We have Daniel Billis. Daniel is a host of a show at Rainier Avenue Radio. We also have a great sports department here at Rainier Avenue Radio. We have shows hosted by Rick Dupree, Granville Emerson, Ronald Laurent, M- Masvita Murari is a host of a Seattle Sports Weekly show. Mark Bryant has a sports fitness-based show. Masvita also hosts a show with Pat McCarthy. And uh, Juan Cotto also hosts a new show with Mike Cobrizzi. So lots going on here at Rainier Avenue Radio. Deb, I'm going to give you a little introduction, then I'm going to fire off a whole bunch of questions. Deb Armstrong doesn't need a long introduction, but I want to share that um, you are a World Cup Alpine ski racer from Seattle, now a mother to a daughter, was the first gold medalist from the U.S. in women's alpine skiing in 12 years, winning the, winning the giant slalom in 1980 at the 1984 Winter Olympics in Sarajevo. I got to share this with you, Deb. When I see the word slalom, I may mispronounce it because it looks like the Hebrew word shalom. So I want to make sure I don't bungle that word, all right? That is okay. There's people out there who know it's uh, slalom and giant slalom. Giant slalom is what I want. Gotcha. Well, if I bungle the pronunciation, will you promise you'll help me? No problem. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Deb was on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine in 1984 after she won the gold medal. Um, Deb also participated in the 88 Olympics in Calgary. She completed her World Cup World Cup career with 18 top finishes. Um, Deb's a member of the Seattle Public School Hall of Fame, the State of Washington Sports Hall of Fame, and the U.S. Ski Hall of Fame, a Seattle native. You're one of our own, Deb. We're on the World Wide Web here, but this is a Seattle-based show. Uh, after Deb's retirement from competitive skiing in 1988, she's been involved in some humanitarian causes and has been a ski coach. Well, Deb, thank you for coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Hey, anything for Seattle, I come from Rainier Ave. I, I grew up in Montlake. I went to Montlake Elementary School and Madrona and Neely Middle School and then Garfield. So I'm a local girl. No doubt about it. And where are you living now? You're in Colorado now, right? I am. That's correct. I'm in Stima, Colorado now. Well, we'll learn more what you're doing in a minute. But I want to go through a little bit about your background. You just mentioned you grew up in Seattle. You attended Garfield High School. And why don't you share with us and the listeners how you specifically got the bug to go into skiing? Well, interesting question. My dad uh, was at the University of Washington clinical psychologist uh, there, and uh, skiing was a weekend activity, and in the winter, in the summer, we hiked in the Cascades and uh, camped and all that, but uh, the winter time is what we did. Uh, we went up to Alpental, and we, we were day skiers. We'd go up on Saturday from Seattle. We'd drive home. We'd drive back up on Sunday, and uh, Mom and Dad got me involved. Uh, with the race team up in Alpental, just for social reasons, to get me with kids who are my age and good little skiers. I was not the best by any means, but I skied at what I considered the best mountain of Alpental. I mean, if you can ski Alpental, you can ski any place on the planet, and I I think that uh, skiing that type of terrain and those conditions made me a, a very athletic skier and set the stage for me being a, a world-class skier. And I also was a good athlete. You know, I played Capitol Hill soccer. I played basketball for Garfield and tennis and volleyball. Um, So I was a multi-sport athlete. Uh, And I have been the only U.S. ski team there that has come out of a big city uh, who, you know, commuted um, to the ski area. Uh, Some may have come from Boston, that sort of thing. But, you know, I had that hour commute on the weekends. And I guess it was when I was a sophomore in high school at Garfield in science class and biology where I was asking myself the question, why am I skiing so much? Because actually basketball was my favorite sport. Um, But, you know, I I realized this was probably in the year of 78, something like that, 77, 78. And I wasn't tall. And I I didn't see much of a future for myself in basketball. And I decided to choose skiing and I guess the rest kind of became history. 
after that. Absolutely. Well, your choice to focus on skiing certainly did not help hurt you at all. And I want to share something with the listeners. I think it's really cool. There's a few ski runs aimed after you at Snoqualmie Pass. That's pretty cool, isn't it, Deb? Well, yeah. I mean, Alpenthal, we started skiing at Alpenthal in 68. And I I think it's 68 was the year that Alpenthal opened. Uh, And I was just a, a little kid then and so yeah i grew up at alpenthal and my parents on the weekends worked at the ski school there uh but you know they had no grand plan uh for me as a skier my mom was a physical education instructor and and you know we were an athletic and active family um but no grand ski racing plan that's for sure they didn't know anything about ski racing but uh yeah, I mean, like I said, it, it, it kind of grew in a very organic way. Great, great background. So it was a huge story. I, I'm a little younger than you, and I remember it back in 84. And big story that you won the gold medal, the Sarajevo Winter Olympics. And just great story. And I, as I mentioned in the introduction, I think you were the first U.S. woman skier to win the gold medal in 12 years. And share with us a couple factors, Deborah that you think helped you win the gold medal that year in 84? I mean, skiing's a sport where, like, less than a second can make a difference. Why don't you share with us a couple um, nuggets of of why you think he won that in 84, that gold medal? Well, actually, you win and lose races in ski racing not by second, not by second, but by hundreds. You know, it's really hard to win and lose races in ski racing. I understand hundreds very well. Right. Uh, you know, I, um, why is that? I, I uh, that's such a big, big question for me. Uh, my, my, like I said, my dad is a psychologist. We had very fun, interesting dinner table conversations at home. The sport was my own. I was a, uh, I was a, a fierce internal competitor with myself. I. Uh, I was somebody at soccer practice with my soccer team, the Spirits, and I played goalie. It it wasn't uncommon where I would go home maybe at the end of soccer practice and I might even cry because I wasn't happy with with my practice, that I felt like I let myself down. I I should have played a little bit better. I loved sports and loved movement. And mom and dad did not get in my way. They let me fully realized who I was uh, and provided opportunity. Um, they, they, it was not, you know, their life and their sport. It, it fully was my own. Uh, there, you know, a number, a few stories. But there was one, my very first World Cup I was ever in. I was 18 years old. It was Europe, uh, in Austria. It was a downhill downhill when you're a rookie you start last I happened to win the training run which was unheard of um I called home and I mentioned to my folks that I had won that run and my dad said well dad you know you didn't know and I I mentioned that everybody else was freaking out around me and dad said you didn't know that you weren't supposed to win meaning I went out there, it was the sky's the limit, I had no inhibition, um, no manufactured rules um, to go by, it, it was just dead in the mountain, and I won, and from that moment on, it, it really was sky's the limit, of uh, the, that I was always competing with myself, for myself, against myself, and Went to work out. I, I worked out a lot at the intramural building at IMA at University of Washington. Um, also at a gym called Sound Mind and Body. I kind of bounced back and forth between the two. Um, and you know, I do I do maybe a hundred sit ups, and I, I kind of self assess. How do you feel, Dad? Well, I can do more, so then I do another hundred, and I get the two hundred. How do you feel, Dad? Self assess. Hmm, I think I can do some more, so then I do another hundred. Self assess. Uh-huh. How do you feel? You know, and that, that was my life. I, you know, if, if you can do more, then do more. It's not about anybody telling me what you should do. 
It's about being real with yourself, kind of reality acceptance. If you've got more in you, do more. If you're tired, take a nap. And uh, I was good at that. So a lot of factors played a role in your 84 victory, gold medal victory in those Olympics. Paul Schneierman here, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with U.S. Olympic gold medalist Deb Armstrong. Deb, you mentioned your parents in our conversation the other minute, and I know your father is a trained psychologist. Do you believe your father's background in psychology? I had a a sports psychologist on my show last year. Do you think that your father's background in psychology helped you with competition? separate your home life from um, your athletic life, professional life, just your life as a whole, right? And uh, so I, growing up, was not aware whatsoever um, about my dad's approach, psychological approach with me, uh, or you know, the things that we would do. I'm sure there are very thoughtful parents, and they had a plan and uh, attentiveness to all of their choices and and what we were doing, and uh, questions that he would ask me and and challenge me with here and there, and and the ways they let me be me and and discover and and learn on my own. Uh, It was not until I was probably 19 or 20 when I actually formally tapped into my dad's profession. Uh, For example, I had some times where I was having difficulty sleeping, and dad helped me in making a relaxation tape, and I took that tape with me to Europe. I put it in my Walkman, if anybody's old enough to remember what Walkmans are. Uh Uh, That's what I had back then, and I could play that tape and I fell asleep to it while I was in Europe, and I didn't have trouble sleeping anymore. So, you know, that would be an example when, when I um, was an older athlete where Dad and I did a, a couple little things like that that were helpful tools. Uh, but I did have an appreciation at a very young age, the power of the brain, the power of thought, the power of visual imagery, the power of... of, of self-motivation and positive self-talk and and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, being 16 years old, for example, this was a story. I was at the Montlake Playfield. I love to play basketball, like I said, and I was 16 probably, and I was aware that I was superstitious. And I thought, you know what, Dad? This is a 16-year-old. Nobody else knew this, but I thought, being superstitious is going to become really inconvenient. i got to deal with Uh it. And so I did. I, I went to the basketball court and I shot free throws forever and played all sorts of mind games with myself to take the power away. And after that, superstition was never a problem for me. And so I never had to be in the starting gate of a ski race and, and worry about superstition. You know, you, you got you to gotta be real and you know what your strengths are and you got to know what your liabilities are and not fool yourself. If you're going to be a champion, you got to you got to. Um, address those head on and be real and deal with it. And, you know, I think those are things that I that I learned on my own at an early age, and it served me well. Well, very interesting answer. I was just curious, being the daughter and a major athlete of a psychologist, what, what your father's uh, role had in your career. It sounds like there was some subtle and direct things that uh, that you gained from, from your dad's uh, profession. This is Paul Schneiderman again, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with U.S. Olympic gold medalist Deborah Armstrong. Deb, real quickly, um, the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics are now on separate four-year circles and alternating even number of years. Do you like this system, or do you prefer to have the Winter and Summer Olympics host in the same year? Well, they, they made that uh, shift. Let me see. Lillehammer. Lillehammer was in 96. Maybe it was 96. Albertville was 92. Lillehammer was 96. Um, no, Lillehammer was 94. So that's that's when it happened. And, and then uh, there was Barcelona with the Dream Team. That was 92. Anyway, oh, you know what? Whatever. I I think it's I think it's probably good 
Uh, I don't know. Good, bad. I, I'm not sure. I'd like the USOC to get their act together. I, I think they've got a bigger problems personally. But alternating summer and winter Olympics every couple of years I, um, is, is fine. Gotcha. Uh, it's every four Yeah. You, you can go along with it. Sounds like, Deb, you can go along with it, but you're kind of agnostic about it. Is that a, a bad way of breaking it down? I think they're, I think they're bigger problems. I, I think that these, I think the USOC is a little bit like a nation, and a nation, you know, that uh, and you, get, you get a lot of power, but things can become corrupt and funky, and, and I think the USOC is, is a little bit funky. And I, I so... Yeah, um, Olympics and alternating summer and winter and all that, I, I think it's worked out just fine. And you're not the only person to have some uh, criticisms of the U.S. Olympic Committee or the Olympic uh, International Committee in general. Um, Deb, 1984 was a big year for you, and you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You won the gold medal competition for skiing in the former Yugoslavia in Sarajevo. And you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And Sports Illustrated is still a really big deal. It's still a huge deal to be on the cover of that magazine. But boy, in that era, back in the 80s, it was a huge, huge deal to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated as an athlete. Did that change you in any way, Deb, as a person, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated? Um, oh, that's a, that's an interesting... Uh... Winning a gold medal um, changes things. Uh, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated was really, really fun and cool. I, I've come to learn that there are an awful lot of people out there who collect autographed Sports Illustrated covers because my entire life I'm, I'm receiving Sports, Sports Illustrated and people want me to sign them. It's pretty funny. Um, I bet. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, that, you know, it's, um, sport is a reflection of, of our culture uh, in, in general. And being a female back in 84 uh, and being on the cover of Sports Illustrated was a pretty big deal. Because Sports Illustrated back in those times, if you made the cover, you would have been probably a basketball player, a football player, maybe a, maybe a professional golfer. Or, you know, but not a, not a whole lot of women made the cover of Sports Illustrated back in those days unless you were a supermodel. Um, and so my cover was Queen of the Mountain, and, and it, that was pretty neat. And it was really fun to come back to the States and uh, see my image on the magazine racks. You know, I'm just like, whoa, because I was a, a sports fan, right? And... I watched the Olympics the way everybody else watches the Olympics, and I I went through Sports Illustrated the way everybody else did. And sure. Here I was, I was on the cover, and uh, and it was really really fun, and um, and it is it is still fun to this day to see my twenty year old baby cheeks on the cover of the magazine. Right. Oh yeah. Well, you know, I I remember back then in the eighties. I mean, Seattle was so proud of you that you were a Seattle product that won an Olympic gold medal. And, you know, 35 years later, your Olympic competitions and being on the cover of Sports Illustrated is still discussed. So it's, it's fun to hear your feedback about that uh, episode in your life. Paul Schneiderman again on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with Deb Armstrong. Deb, you retired from competitive skiing, I believe, in 1988. I believe you're only about 24 years old. Why did you retire when you did? Spot on with that. That was after Calgary, and I was 24. I mean, if you think about it these days, Lindsey Vaughn, uh, Bodie Miller, Ted Ligeti, I mean, people are retiring uh, at the, in their late 30s these days. Right. And, you know, they're, they're, and athletes these days are making a very good living, uh, and the, the sport is completely professionalized. And so these athletes are obviously very incentivized to, to continue on and, and make a lifelong career of the sport. For me at the time, it was transitioning between amateur and, and professional, really. Um, I was tired. I, I, I had only been on the U.S. team for seven years, which is not very long for all that I accomplished. I was tired. There, there was turmoil and a lot of term and a lot of turnover uh, with the coaching staff at that time. I, I I think that the U.S. ski team at the highest, you know, at that point probably wasn't 
running uh, as well as it could have. There this was drama. Mm-hmm. And I felt at the time that I was working too hard and I was quite tired for for that lifestyle. And, and I really wanted to move on with the rest of my life. If I had other role models uh, who were out there that were ski racing longer um, and a little more mentorship at the time, that would have been uh, nice for me, uh, you know, to help me through that time. Because because seven years into an athlete's career, 12 years into an athlete's career, there's different times in athlete's careers where they get tired and, and uh, maybe uh, endure an injury or two and, and just... You, you, you wonder where this life is taking you and how long you can sustain this and where is it going. And, um, and, and also, remember, when, when you're 24 years old, if you don't have many other mentors or much guidance, then when you're 24, you think you're old. You right. You know everything, right? That's true. That? Very true. I, I think that's where I was at, you know. I, I had been at it for a long time, and... I guess I just figured that was the thing to do to retire, and it, <laughs> but also, um, you know, I I wanted to go to school. I wanted to read books. I wanted to write papers, uh, and I've you know been obviously very happy with where my ski career has taken me. I, I've been a skier my entire life and made my living my entire life in the ski industry and. So I I have no regrets in that regard. Sort of feel like you you felt at that time you, you sort of maxed out at twenty four. That's kind of what I'm sort of interp- how I'm interpreting the answer. That, that's, that's kind of how I felt, only because I didn't know anything. I just didn't know any better. Yeah. I was tired, and I didn't know better, and I didn't have any other teammates who were older. I, there was nobody around saying, "Dad, this is ridiculous." I mean, you're a youngster. You you can do this another ten years. No problem. Um, and, uh, you know, so I just, I just moved on. I mean, I don't like to be a one trick pony. I have made my, my career, my entire life in skiing, but I, I like to continue to be relevant, um, right now today and and not living on my past. And I like to continue to learn and grow. And I, I think at that time as a 24 year old, I just wanted to get on with my life. Interesting uh, background. Deb, we got less than five minutes left. I want to get a few more questions in. So real quickly, I believe you're coaching ski now. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of coaching, and, and currently I, I wear a bunch of hats in the industry. I'm, I'm back with uh, the the, ski, the steamboat um, ski area, and uh, so I work with them. I work with their ski school. I, I'm in Jackson Hole right now. Um, uh, doing uh, other ski work, and and uh, I travel around the division conducting clinics for um, the professional ski instructors of America. I, I wear a lot of hats. Um, Sounds and, like it. And uh, still do a lot within the industry. Yep. Yeah, I can tell. So it's, it's really been a big part of your life, to say the least, skiing. So, Deb, we hear a lot about Lindsey Vaughn, Michaela Schifrin, um the ma- the mayors. I mean, there's a lot of well-known skiers. Who who are some skiers that you admire, in particular? Oh gosh, oh man, that um, I admire Michaela Schifrin. You know, she's um, she's uh, her own person and um, going about it in her own ferocious, fierce. Uh, just disciplined way, which you know you you just have to respect and admire. I I admire all of them. I I really do. Uh, but it, but I don't know if I could say that ski racers are are the the athletes that I I look to because I'm such a sports freak. You know, I just I like watching everything. I like watching tennis and. Uh, I mean, every sport that's out there. But I do feel like I understand the skiers. I understand their sport. Um, But I'm not as deep a fanatic or connoisseur of it as a lot of recreational skiers or recreational racers are. Um, I I don't follow it that closely. Interesting. 
I, however, I deep, deep, deep respect for for all of those guys. I, there, I don't know if there's a sport that's harder. I, on my office floor, uh, for for many years, I I've, I've had um, uh, a montage of a ski racer going through a fall and a crash, right? And a ski racing crash, I mean, can just be brutal. And then the caption of the crash is football. Isn't that cute? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's well. Real quickly, kind of a segue to my next question. I'd love to talk to you longer, but we're getting we're kind of winding down already, believe it or not. But I know you overcame a major health challenge back about two thousand four, and I believe you've also been diagnosed with some traumatic brain injury issues related to skiing. What What's your take, Deborah, how, on how ski associations can improve uh, safety for skiers, for example, with TBI issues? Downhill ski racing, there's a lot of micro trauma just from vibration and, and going fast and G forces, similar to what fighter pilots uh, experience in jets. Um, and then, of course, there's falls. And you know, I I don't know. I there's a lot to be learned. You know, the football obviously has to come to terms with the reality of what's going on in their sport. And I think in skiing, uh, head injuries are real and they happen. Uh, I don't think there's been a whole lot of studies. Um, I think people just have to be really aware that that's a frontier that we know nothing about, we know very little about. Every year we're learning a little bit more. Uh, but trauma and hits to the head are, are real. So if you're a parent out there and you got a kid uh, who's in impact sports, skiing, football, whatever it may be, and if your kid gets a concussion, just pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. Real. Deborah, we got less than 10 seconds left. Real quickly, what does the future hold for Deborah Armstrong? Oh, my gosh. Um, playing with my daughter and, and, and loving Seattle and and keeps and, and skiing. What more is there, right? Love it. Deborah, thank you so much for coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. You got it. Bye.